Houston to Puerto Rico and the Bronx. Economic development is often seen as, wow, that could be good. Let's get some money into our neighborhood. But how about adding democracy to it? And then it gets a little more tricky. So I have an elevator pitch I often use when I try to explain to people what I mean when we're talking about solidarity economy or uh, economic democracy or any of the other things we may call this. And I say there are really two elements. And just break down each word real, qu real quickly. Democracy means you know, democratic governance. How do we make sure everybody in the room or in the civil place that we exist are, be are being heard? How are people being heard? How are they understanding? How is information shared? And all the things we understand about being present and listening to each other and making sure that people's voices can actually not just be heard but be implemented. So that's the democracy, and the economics is really a, a transparency of the resources. And how do we make sure that people understand what it is we have to work with? And I think those two elements together can help us create a more democratic, economically fair, equitable space. I'm going to invite Mike Menser, who's a professor of philosophy and urban studies at um, Graduate School and Brooklyn College, and let him take over with the program. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Hey, everybody. Uh, well, I hope I brought my A game today because this is a great panel. Oh. Uh, if you squeeze, squeeze, hashtag monkey talk. Yeah. And if you want to live tweet, tell anyone about live streaming, you can find it on our Facebook page and Twitter, and it will also be on our blog yeah, right. after this over at the Houston Globe. Oh, Thanks. got it. Uh, well, again, welcome, and uh, we got a great panel, and we got a great audience. I know this is, so I'm definitely feeling, feeling the pressure uh, to do this. Um, this is, as Rebecca was saying, I'm, I'm Mike Mentzer. I teach at Brooklyn College and at the CUNY Graduate Center. I'm in philosophy and urban sustainability studies. I've recently been uh, asked to join uh, Caribbean studies just because there's so much interconnection kind of happening right now, which is really exciting to see. And we're going to get into that tonight, and we definitely have panelists who can talk about this work and how it's happened and how it's operating on the ground uh, in different sectors. Uh, and so I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, introduce them, just kind of tell you who they are right now, uh, and then uh, tell you about the sequence and so on, and then I'm just gonna explain a little bit about the project and the framework that we're doing, and then we'll bring everybody up here and we'll start the conversation. So as you know for the program, um, we have uh, Gabriela Alvarez, who's the chef and founder of Liberation Cuisine, a catering company dedicated to preparing meals collectively with sustainable ingredients and practices. Uh, and she recently took her passion for healing and organizing with food to Puerto Rico to help with the relief and rebuilding efforts. Uh, we have Kali Acuno, uh, co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson, a network of cooperatives and worker-owned enterprises. Uh, and as Rebecca mentioned, uh, the author of Jackson Rising, which I also am, am reading and pouring through as well. Uh, and we have Jorman Nunez, uh, from the, the program manager at Community Innovators Lab, MIT, and coordinator of the Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative. So these projects, what do they share? Um, as Rebecca was saying, and it, it, there's a lot of different ways of portraying this and characterizing this work. Um, it's in a sense an alternative form of economic development, one that's sustainable and, and inclusive and democratic. And we've called it an economic democracy. There's a lot of other kind of frameworks for it. And this statement, which is, is jar, you know, it's not jargony, it's, it's a lot, it's, it's long, it's awkward. It's very much a collective product of a lot of different conversations that we've been having. Um, I'm president and co-founder of the Participatory Budgeting Project. Uh, that's a nonprofit that hopefully a lot of you all participated with participatory budgeting uh, in, uh, in, the United, in uh, New York City. We're in 25 different cities uh, across the U.S. and Canada right now. And a lot of this is also coming from that space. Um, so it's a mix of kind of the theoretical debates and also the, the concepts and the articulations of the practitioners. And just, I, I, I am going to read it because we're practitioners, but we're scholarly and we got we to go back and forth. And I think that's a largely what today is, is, a, is in part about. Um, so economic democracy is the idea that the principles of popular sovereignty and the values of freedom, equality, and solidarity can be applied to the economic system in a way that empowers uh, our groups from, uh, and workers and owners to customers and residents. Econ D practices do this by promoting inclusive and meaningful participation in terms of financing, ownership, management, labor, regulation, consumption, and waste disposal. Pluralistic in its origins and history, Econ D projects vary in the relationship to states, markets, communities, and individuals. Econ D projects occur in multiple sectors, including banking and finance, such as credit unions, the workplace, ESOPs and worker co-ops, consumption, consumer co-ops, 
land ownership, CLTs, and multi-stakeholder cooperatives, and service delivery, uh, social public utilities. From food sovereignty to energy democracy, though some regard themselves as liberal capitalists and others as democratic socialists, many others eschew such categories or aspire to more experimental pluralistic frames, such as solidarity economy or new, so, new social contract. And there's actually an event at the New School uh, in a couple of weeks called, uh, that goes this, by this framework, the New Social Contract. Still, others root themselves in dissimilar ethical or cultural traditions. They could be religious, they could be indigenous, or they could be, it could be ecological. So, and I state this because people come at this from a lot of different angles. And they come at this from a lot of different sectors. And what's crucial, and I think a lot of us know, is that to do this kind of combat and replacement, right, it's both combat and replacement what we're trying to do, requires this really deeply holistic and interdimensional perspective. And no one group can do that. Uh, and we have to be very you know, aware of that. Well, a lot of times we'll say, well, that group's great, but they don't do X. Or this group is great, but they don't do Y. No group can do everything. It's really about this combination and connection of lots of different groups doing lots of different work and lots of different sectors. And so this idea of economic democracy is trying to capture all this work. And a lot of times these groups don't even identify with each other. Um, but how can we kind of get an identification going so that we can scale up and perif peripherate these practices that we love and they work at these small scales, but we know how to have to hit, uh, hit the next level. And as all you know, we're in this double crisis right now with respect to the ecological crisis and with respect to what I would call the inequality crisis. And the ecological crisis is, and I know there's a lot of folks here working on climate change, but even if climate change was not happening, even if the climate was totally fine, we'd still be in an ecological crisis. Because of pollution, because of the plastics, because of, of water quality issues, because of deforestation, because of the agricultural crisis, and so on. And then the inequality crisis, we have the political manifestations of it, of deeply flawed or dysfunctional governments, the return of authoritarianism, uh, and also on the economic side, with the massive concentration of wealth. And so when we think about what de uh, the democracy means in this context, um, this notion of participatory democracy, uh, which you know, Rebecca was uh, kind enough to mention, just I've, I've been thinking about this for about nine years, and, and this book just came out a couple months ago. And in this book, one of the key ideas of this conception of participatory democracy for me is that it's not simply about having a voice. How democracy came to be understood as having a voice is a long conversation. You can blame Andrew Jackson. It goes back to the 1800s. But democracy, I mean, having a voice is nice. But democracy is about sharing power. It's about sharing power. It's a huge difference. And Sherry Arnstein, who was a bureaucrat back in the 60s who defected from the Department of City Planning, you know, she talked about participation as the redistribution of power. Not being able to put your idea on a, on a, on a, on a post-it note on a, on a wall, which we do it sometimes, and it's fine. Um, but where there's a power dynamic that's in play, and I get some. So, and what I, I kind of characterize this as a sort of a maximization. We need to empower ourselves in these four different principles. And these are, again, principles that I've kind of gleaned onto after working with so many groups, including folks in here, over the last several years. And the first is really this idea of collective determination, that we get together and get to set the agenda. That's all it means. We set the agenda. The second is we can't do this work without developing cap capacities both for, as individuals or and as groups. It might be consensus decision-making procedures. It might be knowing about finance. Uh, it might be conflict resolution. It might be specific skills like composting. Uh, the third is we have to replace unequal power relations with associations of shared authority. So it's not just about getting stuff, but it's also about changing the authority dynamic. And how do we share authority? That's got to be part of the participation redistribution process. And the other is, we're painfully aware that none of us can do this by ourselves. And we're painfully aware that even our favorite organization, whatever it is, can't do it by itself. We have to be relentlessly expansive and interconnecting, but in more meaningful, sustained ways. And this is what I call kind of expansive solidarity, um, which is construction, cultivation, uh, interconnection of movements and organizations. So these are sort of the four principles of what I call maximal democracy or participatory democracy. Um, I'm just going to tell one story, and then I'm going to break it down, and we're going to have the conversation. Um, so one, I, one uh, group in the book, how many people have heard of Saikatsu? Now, this is a fancy audience, so I know there's some folks. So definitely, I, we, how many people have heard of Mondragon? How many people have heard of Mondragon? Okay. 
So a lot of folks know about Mondragon. I got a, there's about a chapter in the book on Mondragon. Um, but when I came across Saikatsu, I was really struck by how many people were not familiar with it. Saikatsu was a consumer cooperative that started in 1965 when 300 women came together to get 200, or sorry, 200 women came together to get 300 bottles of milk. And at that time, there was this really devastating pollution crisis happening in Japan. Not because of fallout, because a lot of times students will ask me, because of fallout from the bombing. I said, no, from industrialization. Not from bombing, but from industrialization. And the food supply becomes so tainted that there were a lot of deaths, there were a lot of poisonings, and they were trying to find a safe bottle of milk. They, had, they didn't trust the government, they didn't trust um, the supermarket. Uh, as they put it, not only was the supermarket contaminated, but so was the government, right? So they didn't know where to go. So they basically searched for farmers for months to find a farmer that they could trust the milk coming from that place. They found it, and they built this, what was originally a buying club. Um, uh, they pull in more and more people. Uh, it's collectively organized. It's run by housewives. Um, and may, what we would call as middle class, urban, uh, in and around Tokyo. Uh, they end up saving money from that. Then they create their own dairy. Uh, they expand beyond a few food products to carry 1,600 products, uh, including laundry soap. Uh, the pollution crisis was also caused by uh, uh, detergents being dumped into the, to the local waterways. So they came up with their own biodegradable soap. They do their own regulation. The government doesn't, it's not the FDA or the Japanese FDA or whatever. They train themselves to regulate their own food uh, chains and own supply chains. They have about 400,000 members now. Uh, and then they expanded into elder care and daycare, which are huge issues uh, in many countries, especially Japan, uh, has, which has an aging population. Uh, and they also realized that even though initially they didn't trust the government uh, and they didn't expect the government to do it, they can't transform the system without it. So they ended up running for office, and over 200 of them run, run for office and won. So this is an example which, if you go back to those principles, right, they set the agenda, they developed the capabilities. Um, They've even, again, one of the things I think is most innovative about them is they developed a grassroots administration, a grassroots regulation. Um, they replace these hierarchies with uh, a collaborative shared authority, uh, and they've interconnected relentlessly. And they also advocate, and they're supporters of Via Campesina at the global level. So uh, in terms of, uh, in my book, I go through Mondragon, I talk about Saikatsu, I talk about a number of other cooperatives and, and, and other uh, forms. And I just want to lift out four of what I have been able to discern as, as best practices among these kinds of groups. And if you look at these different, and I talk about participatory budgeting uh, as well, and, um, and basically the ones that have been able to sustain themselves and proliferate over the last 30 years or so, most, all of them had at least three of these four, and, and, and a few of them had all four. And the first is they had a research unit or a university from the start. So they could do self-studies, so they could advocate to other groups and to governments, and they, so they could innovate and retrain. Um, I think CIDAD, which is based in Brazil, which studied participatory budgeting from the beginning, uh, was one of the most impressive forms of this, because they realized early on who wasn't participating or how they were failing to reach out to groups, so they were constantly, relentlessly scrutinizing themselves. Mondragon, as, as folks know, uh, have uh, about 19 technical centers, right, that are constantly retraining and also doing studies of uh, economic studies of markets. Um, the, most of them, although Mondragon didn't really right, have a social movement, uh, most of them had social movements. Uh, I think in Quebec, when you look at the, uh, the solidarity coming in Quebec, there was the women's movement that really galvanized that and got the government to, to collaborate. In Japan, it was the peace movement and also food and environment movement that really got um, Saikatsu to be able to spread. The third is there was some sort of independent coordinating body that was separate from the government but coordinated with the government and was able to get tax breaks or subsidies um, or other kinds of uh, supports. La Lega in Italy, the Northern European co-ops, if folks know that, uh, is a great example of that. I don't know why I put the Chantier there. It's actually Desjardins, the, the credit union, right? Uh, but I guess the Chantier could, could be in there as well, uh, in Quebec. And then the Saikatsu had their own independent um, organization, which was called the ICC. And then that last one, which is certainly an elusive one, and when we love to have our own bank, although we kind of have some, you know, we have some stuff. Um, but if you have your own bank and your own university, you're, you're, you're swimming, uh, you're good. Uh, and Mondragon has a very, uh, uh, very capable one that can actually do small business services as well as financing, right? So these are four, um, four best practices I've seen. And so, I, and I, I mentioned this um, because I see this as, this is gonna inform the conversation that we're gonna have today. Um, so if I could invite the panelists 
to join us up front? And I want to welcome Colleen, Jorban, and Gabriella. Thank you for coming up. So uh, we've laid out the, the framework. Uh, this is the fewest slides I've ever used in a presentation in my entire life. Some people who know. I, and the reason is because this is a, this is a serious panel. Um, and we want to hear uh, the comments and have a conversation around this framework and these issues. And so we're going to begin with uh, Kali, then we'll go to Jorman, and then we'll go to Gabriella. Uh, and the first question we just want to uh, ask, I'm going to ask each to just describe their work, how does it connect to this project of, of economic democracy? Um, and then and we'll have everybody respond. And in the second round of questions, we'll get more into a conversation around opportunities and challenges in terms of deepening and scaling these efforts. So I'll start off with Kali. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, glad everybody could uh, make it on out. Um, well, let me start first and foremost by uh, noting that um, our, our overall project started off as a political project. Um, one, seeking um, kind of first and foremost uh, the accomplishment of self-determination for historically um, oppressed people, black people in Jackson, Mississippi and throughout uh, Mississippi, what we call the Jackson Cush area. Um, it grew out of generations of struggle. That's one thing folks should be aware of. Like we, we didn't, uh, we're not starting something new or, um, you know, it just didn't come out of nowhere. Like there's a foundation uh, for it that was laid really long before I was born, probably most before people in here were born. Um, so that's important to really, I think, kind of put in perspective. Um, and what we really represent is, is an articulation, articulation of a strategy uh, that myself and a larger group of people started really working on um, almost 20 years ago now. Um, you know, um, first in response to events after September 11th, and then more, I think even more importantly, events after uh, kind of Hurricane Katrina, uh, and really trying to, uh, both of those events uh, really kind of sh shaping and sharpening our analysis of a new, kind of a new era, bringing up new questions, uh, and dealing with some new manifestations of kind of some old problems, some old issues. And the one that was really brought home uh, to me, particularly from Hurricane Katrina, uh, was the extent to which uh, I always say it sometimes that, that the rhetoric that many of us were using about black folks being disposable was put on full display for the world to see. And I think that there was a, a insufficient response to that overall. And we were trying to, you know, uh, have our response. And, and that led to uh, folks on the ground in Jackson and folks, you know, kind of scattered throughout the United States working in the think tank to try to come up with the, with the piece that eventually came to be called the Jackson Cush Plan. Um, now that, that particular piece has three kind of fundamental components to it. Uh, the one which I would say really um, is and should be, uh, and that's an important thing that we can talk about later, uh, the kind of the driving forces, the People's uh, Assembly, uh, which is the space for uh, radical transformative democracy, participatory democracy. Um, the kind of second anchor uh, is the one that, that cooperates in Jackson specifically uh, was, was born and built to try to deal with it, and that is building the solidarity economy. And we need to talk about what that means for, for us. Uh, and I'll just mention briefly, um, we are always trying to make sure that everyone first and foremost understands that when we say build the solidarity economy, we're not talking about starting something from scratch. It already exists. Right, that already functions, and, and to a great extent, um, in Jackson, just as it is here, I'm sure most black, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Haitian, working class communities, folks are not su going to survive without a certain degree of sharing 
you know, within the family, within the household. That's part of the solidarity economy. It already exists. It's organic. Nobody has to teach anything or anybody about it, like, you know, uh, in that degree. The question, the thing that we've been trying to figure out, and it's going to take time, is how do you take that from kind of the the informal household networks and extend that broader so that I can do a certain level of mutual exchange and value sharing with people on one end of town who may or may not know me, right? Uh, so that we can circulate, you know, more value uh, amongst each other to improve the overall quality of life. And that's an aspirational thing that we're trying to develop. But a critical thing is to understand what we mean by developing the solidarity economy and what our role is. And then the third component, <clears throat> just trying to go brief, is, is independent electoral politics. Um, and that probably is the thing that has drawn, that particular element has probably drawn people uh, the most attention about what's going on in Jackson the past 10 years. And that's not necessarily the, the, a bad focus, uh, but I think uh, there's been too much even on the left and progressive focus of, uh, forces amongst fun focusing on that as the predominant thing, you know, uh, or, or the most transformative thing about this overall project. Uh, and I challenge all of us to take a deeper view and to look more at the, the level of participatory piece and the economic piece. Uh, now, in terms of where we are at and what we're doing, we've, we've, made a, um, we've made a priority, first and foremost, uh, on building a land trust, community land trust, and acquiring property. That was the first thing out the box for us um, and that's based upon two lines of, you know, thinking. Number one, um, poor black folks having to rent from other folks to do anything usually doesn't lead to too much success in the long term. Uh, and number, number two, uh, we've learned from y'all as to what's going on in the Bronx, what's going on in Brooklyn, what's going on in Harlem about how quickly we can be dispossessed from our communities. Um, and part of that is because we don't, we don't have uh, a communal ownership stake in these communities, right? And we don't own it. So we wanted to change that dynamic and change it quick while there was some opportunity to do so based upon the current depressed real estate values in, in Jackson, which are not going to stay that way forever, right? Uh, so that's number one. And then the other piece has been, you know, gradually, slowly through a lot of trial and error, uh, uh, success and failures. Uh, building an integrated and intentionally integrated interdependent network of worker cooperative, worker owned cooperative. And where we're at now, um, in terms of things being uh, uh, fully articulated, uh, there's a catering co op, uh, there's a lawn care and composting co op, um, there is a, the Freedom Farms, and then there's one which, which is getting off the ground, which is a very experimental, very much a risk taking venture which is our community development cooperative, which would do uh, elements of, of training, uh, coding, uh, uh, on-demand uh, manufacturing using digital fabrication. Uh, and then the, point, the component of it that we are most interested in investing in is the piece called the community production, which is uh, in the first stage taking uh, the profits generated from this to be able to do actual infrastructural work in our community based upon democratic decisions that the community makes about what is needed. Um, so we are taking a big risk because part of this is, on a deeper level, uh, part of this is, is recognizing and looking at the trajectory of both the economy and technology and seeing the, 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 the convergence of automation and globalization, making people who are black and brown, particularly in this country, more and more irrelevant to the overall productive process. Um, and we're trying to get ahead of that curve and humanize it and put this under the direct control of our folks so we can rearticulate and shape another element, another dimension of our future. This is a long-term piece that ain't gonna happen tomorrow, it ain't gonna happen next, you know, next year, maybe even 10 years from now, but we're trying to make sure that we position ourselves to be in the game to be a driving force of it. Um, so I'll, I'll stop with that, uh, and i touch on that last because we, we took some of that from some folks right, you know, uh, up up here that are that are close to all of you. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jorman Nunez. Um, I'm. Uh, this is this is recent, so 
it's it's fine. I'm actually now the uh, director of the Just Urban Economies program at MIT CoLab, uh, and thank you, thank you, <laughs> um, and uh, have have helped to start and grow and uh, um, coordinate the Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative, which is a coalition of community groups, entrepreneurs, business development folks, finance and government that are trying to build or lead an economic development agenda in the Bronx that's rooted in building shared wealth and ownership for low-income people at scale. Um, so a bit about our work. Uh, let me first start with how, how we started. So, you know, BCDI really was uh, founded and formed and took shape uh, because of the history of community organizing that has happened in the Bronx. So, you know, the history of disinvestment um, that has happened, plant shrinkage, redlining, uh, uh, burn, you know, landlords burning their buildings to collect the insurance money, um, bussing people out of the community, <laughs> bussing people out, you know, you know, that were homeless to New Jersey and other places without uh, letting folks even know uh, what was what was going on? Uh, a lot of folks have developed groups to fight back against that, um, and to help folks recognize their collective power, uh, for and and gain you know the ability to um, stop it and also dream, imagine a world or a Bronx that could be, and fight for that uh, as well. So you know we have organizations that have been around for forty plus years uh, doing that and has created a, a culture in, in, in the Bronx of, of, organi of organizing and fighting back. So, you know, uh, about six, seven, maybe more now, uh, time, you know, blends together for me. Uh, years ago, uh, a lot of, some of the community, lead community organizers and executive directors of the usual suspects uh, in, in the Bronx uh, came together and had a self-critique of their organizing, right? Um, Folks uh, looked at their organizing power over time. So if you take any community organization and roughly, you know, arguably put their like organizing strength or power on a graph, um, you can argue that over time they've been getting better, their organizing has been getting more powerful and better and better. We, through social media, contact members a lot more regularly, joining a lot more coalitions, a lot more sophisticated policy fights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you look at uh, our membership base, uh, and the folks that live in our catchment area for the same amount of time, uh, they've been getting poorer and poorer. And what they were seeing was that uh, their organizing victories didn't lead to their members owning and controlling the assets that were driving the policy changes they were fighting in the first place. Uh, so wanted to talk about how, as organizers, do we shift our organizing to uh, enable us to to address that issue, right? We got annual reports every year. We put, we put in our victory, where you know, our victories are there and putting it forward every year. How do we, um, how do we address this? So we were inspired by a lot of examples. Um, Mondragon was a huge inspiration. The Evergreen Initiative in Cleveland was a huge inspiration. Um, Mark Rakeek Plaza in San Diego was a huge inspiration and, and others. And, like Kali was saying, one thing I really want to underscore was it wasn't like we were trying to think of something new. <laughs> um, you know, when we we teach, we we run economic demo our economic democracy training series, and what we start on in economic democracy 101 uh, is when it when you look at how people respond to systemic oppression, systemic violence, uh, collective ownership, <laughs> collective governance has always been core and central to that response. Uh, we've been doing it this for a long time. Ella Baker, when she was the president of the Young Negro Cooperative League, you know, in the strategic plan, it was something crazy. Like, next year, you know, you gotta start a chapter in all these places, and the next year, you gotta have a co-op up, and then the year after that, you gotta have a credit union up. You know, like, they, folks were already talking about this. In Colombia, in the Pacific, Pacific region, by law, 80% of the entire region has to be owned by Afro and indigenous folks through uh, local community councils um, and 
uh, made up of uh, Afro and indigenous folks. And, and there's, there's a lot of other examples I could, I could talk about to, to, to make that point, but just, just for time. This isn't like new, this is, in our view, continuing the uh, black economic democracy, the, the push for shared wealth and ownership is a continuation of black freedom struggle. Um, but, so folks took that question, how do we shift our organizing? We're inspired by all these examples. Um, and what that led us to was we want to um, build structures that help position people in the Bronx to own their economy. Uh, and economic democracy to us, uh, one, it's an evolving definition, right, and changes depending on your context. And in our context, um, you know, an economy is driven by assets. <laughs> and when those assets are collectively owned, uh, and governed by those most impacted by the economy, you have, you have economic democracy. So we took the time to analyze assets in the Bronx and think of what could be you know, po some powerful projects. And what we've come to is we wanna build what we call uh, a community enterprise network. Um, a network of key institutions uh, that, are net, uh, um, that work closely together, that are community owned, uh, that uh, will have the capacities folks need to make major plays in, in the economy and to like shift, um, shift the economy towards a direction that uh, embodies our vision and values. So the, the network we want to build has six institutions, four of which are in their prototype phase or have launched, two that are still in the conceptual phase for us. Um, so one, we want to build or have built a planning and policy an action uh, lab or organization, like our think and action tank, although we really don't like uh, the phrase think tank. Um, but you know, folks felt uh, that we need capacity to uh, plan in the short term and plan in the long term for how we're gonna build economic democracy at scale in the Bronx. We need to be able to take care of the now and, and the future and make sure the steps that we're taking now Move, move forward. And this really mattered because, um, you know, oftentimes groups in the Bronx, and no, no shade to none of the groups I'm about to mention, you know, but folks have to, have to folks felt like they have to depend on, you know, uh, great organizations like the Urban Justice Center and Pratt, you know, folks that are outside of the Bronx, but really wanted to build, want to build local capacity uh, for, for, for planning and coordination. Uh, we also looked a lot at procurement uh, as, you know, one of those assets that we, underutilized assets that we have here, we looked at the top 22 anchor institutions or the top 22 nonprofit purchasers in the Bronx. Collectively, they spend $9 billion on goods and services a year. Where is that, where is that going? Uh, we're, we're building something called the Bronx Exchange, which is a business platform that is uh, uh, aimed at figuring out how we can leverage those institutional dollars, those in, that, that institutional spending and drive it towards um, local businesses that are committed to building community wealth and can talk more about that later. We're also um, building um, our Economic Democracy Learning Center. We actually in many ways started this, started with this. We've uh, developed this 500 page curriculum, our Economic Democracy Training Series that we uh, um, train with grassroots residents in the Bronx to, to help folks think about and help folks develop a framework for how to even uh, develop your your economy. Um, we've also um, been building our Bronx Innovation Factory, so we have a, a prototype facility at our offices, um, and that's about you know if we're gonna make major plays in the economy, if we're gonna own our economy, we have to own our own productive capacity, right? We have to be able to make things. Uh, we have to be able to rapidly prototype and and learn and 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 work together and and. And, and use the things we make to address the challenges we face in the Bronx. Uh, and so all those things are up and running in some, some ways, on fo some, some way. Um, and we're also trying to build a Bronx Fund for Economic Democracy. Uh, it's really thinking about how do we capitalize this network over time um, and, and this work, and it can't be found, found, uh, foundation dependent. Um, and then finally, 
uh, we're trying to build what we call a civic action hub. What would, there's a lot of advocacy. There's a lot of community organizing happening in the Bronx. What would happen if there was something that existed specifically to, to coordinate all of us um, to make much more strategic political plays uh, where we're, we're, where we could be greater than the sum of some of our parts. So those are the the six pieces. That's the 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 model we're trying to build in the borough that we believe will help us be the foundation for economic democracy in the Bronx. And I could talk more about like uh, where we want to go with that later. But that's that's our work. Great. Hi everyone. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, yeah, so similarly, I want to acknowledge um, those who have been doing the work for many, many years, many generations um, before me. And I'll be talking um, about my work and in particular about the work that's been going on in Puerto Rico um, for a long time, and especially now post Hurricane Maria, which hit at the end of, wow, the September, right? Um, and yeah, so sort of just like foundation, Puerto Rico um, was the colony of Spain and then handed off to the United States. And so while terms change, it is still a colony of the United States. Um, and so organizing then and like these, these concepts are sort of within that context um, on this island. And so just to like keep that in mind and um, as we think about solutions as well, like how we are making those, um, sharing those models and sharing all these information with folks who are within a different political and economic world um, and on an island, right? Uh, so a little bit about how I got into this. I'm, I'm a chef, and so I'm really committed to cooking for movement work and cooking for the transformation that so many folks are working on around the world, around this country, um, and in New York. And so um, in Puerto Rico, that has really meant um, especially after the hurricane, like you mentioned, um, letting them set the agenda, just saying, this is my particular skill, I can cook, how can I support you all? And letting them really you know, lead the way, saying this is how you can support. And then once I showed up, that shifted, right? Like I had an idea of what it would be, and then once I got there, it really changed. So um, since uh, really before, since before the hurricane, uh, there were there were centros de apoyo mutuo, which is um, uh, mutual support centers that have, were popping up um, around the island. And then after the hurricane, we're popping up more and more. So there's like maybe like ten or twelve at this point, and they have really been organizing and, and figuring out what do we need to do in order to be sustainable, because the reality was has been and then was shown. Uh, I like to say Hurricane Maria like wiped everything out. So, you you know, tree, trees were wiped out so you could literally see like houses and really poor communities that you couldn't visibly see before, like driving down the highway. And then you could also see all of the political economic things were, that were not working. And so it was just this sort of like wake up call that um, aid took so long to get to communities and some folks are still waiting. Um, and what was really working was people really locally and collectively figuring out how to get food and water to um, everyone, to people who couldn't leave their homes because maybe they were like in bed and couldn't weren't mobile, to people with babies, how to get them what they needed um, for their children, like people who didn't have roofs, making sure that tarps were really strategically taken to the people who needed it, um, and really making sure that resources were um, being efficiently and effectively used. Um, and so, and, and then with that, really making the connection as much as possible with the diaspora and with folks um, around the world and in the United States who had, you know, who did have access to resources, how to really get that strategically um, to the island. So it often meant like, I'm flying out to Puerto Rico on Friday, meet me at JFK, give me the suitcase with uh, supplies, I'll take it to San Juan, and then someone in San Juan who is, you know, at a nonprofit or just a collective organization will pick that up and then they pass it on and they know their community they know who lives in what house they know whose cousin you know needs whatever medication and they were really able to get that out um, and so since they've really been figuring out um, long term what does that look like so looking at models like what cooperative models exist 
um, what sort of collective models for feeding each other and like working with farms. So thinking about like CSAs or just thinking like what has worked um, and how can we apply those models in Puerto Rico. Um, and so for me, what that meant was like, I'm just going to feed you all so you can keep thinking really clearly about what you need to do. Um, and then offering workshops around both uh, canning, so food preservation, because we're about to go back into hurricane season starts, I think, in like June, right? Um, so uh, we're about to go in. So in terms of food preservation, if you know a hurricane is coming, you have food in your refrigerator or there are like food on the trees and, you know, the plants. What do you do with that to preserve it as long as possible so that the week after the hurricane, while aid is hopefully on its way or people are organizing themselves, um, you have something there. And then the other uh, thing that I was really focusing on, and this was directly asks that were made. This is like, I have not lived through a hurricane. I did not live th through this hurricane, but by speaking with people and, and learning from their experience, then I can support with whatever I can. So the second piece was really around uh, sprouting seeds. So, so much of the farming industry and like land and food was really wiped out by this natural disaster. Um, and so, it takes time to grow a plantain tree. It takes time to get lettuce growing. It takes time. It takes three years for a coffee tree to grow. So then what does that mean in the immediate? Like sprouts will grow in three, four, or five days. Um, so that's like raw, green, fresh things that you can eat in the immediate. And so really using these, these are like concrete things that you can do. And it's also things to just share with people like, we can do this. Um, these, are con these are practical things that we can do. And if we're doing it collectively and each person does one thing, then we can be feeding so many people. Um, and with that, the Centros de Apoyo Mutuo, uh, I mean, one story in Caguas is, has really, really developed uh, situation that they have going on and they not only do food they have arts for kids they have wellness for kids they have acupuncture they have um, all kinds of things that they're really working on and more and more trying to like get more resources for their community and have it be holistic um, but they you know the first day after the hurricane they like were started serving food out of a kitchen and then you know, so many people were lined up and then the next day someone came with the stove out of their own kitchen and brought it and then they had two stoves and were like double, tripling, quadrupling and at one point they were feeding like 600 people per, per day. Um, so, so this is just like one example of how people have been, have been organizing and are continuing to really figure out what that looks like. Um, this is no, there's no hierarchy here. There is really, um, you know, many of these folks have been working for sovereignty, you know, sovereignty for the island. And that can be political, that can be food wise, that can be in all different ways. Like, what does that look like? Um, they've been working on this for, for a long, long time. And so that is in direct contradiction from the political relationship that Puerto Rico has with the United States. And so they often get pushback and that pushback often looks like marginalization and really just getting left out of whatever conversations are going on around now, the conversation is rebuilding in Puerto Rico. That's the term you hear all the time. And so many of these folks are left out of those conversations while they're on the ground really doing the work and coming up with concrete solutions. Um, and so, yeah, thinking about like what, you know, what those connections what those connections looks like. These folks are often working without that connection. And what, what could that look like, I think, is, is an important conversation. Um, and then in terms of funding, they're also left out of the conversation. Um, so much funding has gone to the island. And we've seen this in Haiti. We've seen this in so many places after like weather disasters, um, where how do we, you know, as people who have like resource, make sure that we're getting it directly to folks who are doing this work of like democracy, of like we all have power, we all have like resource, and we're using this for a collective, a collective purpose. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Yeah, another another thing I'll mention that folks are really thinking about in Puerto Rico. Um, we mentioned, I don't think anyone said it, but like just gentrification and displacement. Um, it's been happening a lot in Puerto Rico, but like especially now with the economic situation and the board that has been imposed on the island to basically like basically manage the money and basically squeeze as much out of the people as possible and, and like limit how much can get to the island so that the um, hedge funders can get paid before, right, people are really taken care of is that um, more people are coming to develop on the island and more privatization is happening all happening throughout. Uh, 
And so what does that mean in terms of land? Like land being something that can feed us and take care of us. And it's what we like, what, it's what sustains us. Um, people are really doing some really beautiful work around like how do we make sure that land is being used for collective purposes and rather than thinking about like I need to own land like not land being owned and privatized but how do we use it and let it like fill us up and use it in collective ways. The light is green. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, we heard all of the folks hit on setting the agenda, developing capability, solidarity, talking about what it looks like in specific places. For the next round of questions, and then we're going to open it up. Um, but if you could just give a response. So when you think about the deepening and or the proliferating of your project, hitting that next level, evolving, um, what do you see as Optical and uh, obstacle, and also as the potential or the capability, and and I and, and if you can, one thing, um, and I didn't put this slide up, but um, I'll show you the next slide, sorry, uh, is one thing that kind of lurks is that you know we all you know we, and we heard allus allusions to gentrification, displacement, that harks back to neoliberalism, to to uh, and and specific vehicles like public-private partnerships, right, and the way that they're used, they use government to squeeze people. So what is the partner, what is the, I call it the social public partnership, like what's our partnership look like? Like when we're driving the agenda of government. So, and I know that some of y'all have thought deep and, and already have kind of examples of this, um, but what might that look like in this too? So as, as, as ways of, what's a specific thing that the government or the, the local jurisdiction can do to help your own project, this project you're involved with evolve and so on? That makes sense? Yeah. yeah. Or you can reject that and just talk about what you're going to talk about anyway. Um, so do you, do you folks mind if I complicate that a little bit? Um, because, you know, that there's three, there's three different levels of scale here that we're talking about in utilizing the, the, the experience that's here. Um, and I want to note that to say, I think there's there's more of a methodology and approach that we should be striving at rather than looking for cookie cutter examples of what's going to work. Because what what will, could potentially work in, in Jackson may not have any relevance to what's going to work in Puerto Rico. Um, the conditions are different. You know, uh, the balance of forces politically are different. Um, but I think there's some some principles and organizing methodology that throughout that we can hark on. Uh, and how do we come up? I think the more critical question is how do we come up, you know, with the strategies and analysis given our own circumstances, you know, that, that enable us to make the greatest transformations possible. And then I think is how do we link up with each other in a concrete way, you know, beyond just rhetorical solidarity, you know, but um, like in our case, we've been trying to figure out there's a good number of myself and a good number of people, you know, were on the ground in Katrina a couple of years after that happened. Um, you know, and some folks have been trying to, um, you know, ask me to come down, you know, since the hurricane, for example. And, you know, I've been saying, no, no, I'm not. A, I'm just like, I'm still shell-shocked from what the hell I went through 10 years ago on, on one level. Uh, and then on another level, it's like, is that the best utili utilization of resources? You know, because I can write you something, I can talk to you about what I went through, you know, on a certain level. Um, but to me, I'm like, look, you asked me to come down, I might be able to be, be there a week. You know, uh, I'm not going to be there on a day to day. I'm not going to be there for a year. I'm not going to be there for six months. You know, so maybe consulting may be a better use of the sparse resources, you know, that, that you could pull together. Now, bringing that, um, you know, like home to bear because um, in our context, then I'm going to say a, a, a contrast to uh, New York. In our context, 
uh, government is actually very limited in what it can do. You know, Jackson is a mid-sized, you know, southern city, barely 200,000 people in the city. The, the budget of a borough here is three and four times the size of, of the overall Jackson city budget. You know, last time I looked at, uh, uh, I think the, the budget for the borough of Brooklyn was something like $10 billion. Is this, anybody here from Brooklyn know that? You know, easily, right? I mean, we barely scratching uh, about $800,000 budget for the overall city in Jackson, right? So in terms of, you know, looking for certain resources from the city, in our case, is really rather limited. Instead, it's what can we help, the, the, to a certain extent, what can we help the city do? What can we help from the social movement side? What can we help the city do? What can we create the conditions that will enable certain level of policy changes? But then we also have to be very smart and strategic in our context because our state is basically run by the Tea Party. You know, uh, they have a super majority in, in the state legislature, which means fundamentally they can do what they want to do. And so we got to be careful because we've made some mistakes of, of saying some stuff too too boldly, too loudly, too early. And then they, they just, okay, y'all want to do that? We'll just create a law which says you can't do that. You know, we're going to be preemptive and, and not do it. So some of the things now is more or less, let's just do it and then we'll ask permission later. You know, rather than telegraphing, let's, let's just do it and then we'll ask, you know, we'll ask permission later. Uh, but it's like building that that infrastructure. I think you know from the from the ground up is the first critical piece, and the challenge that we have, you know, which we've tried to address, you know, in in in, uh, in our model uh, to get in more specifically, what we, we tried to address, you know, one of the deepest things that we have to to deal with, you know, that that uh, Puerto Rico I think has this problem that's similar to us. But New York doesn't necessarily have it in the same degree, and that is our access to actual capital and financial resources is very limited in, in Jackson. Not, not necessarily from what comes in, but if me asking the existing banking structure to give to the to you know homeless folks who are our membership and folks who just got to like that's very limited. And then there's the political dimension of who we who we are and who they know we are and what we've been asserting. I'm not sure I'm going to give you some money if I want to give you some money to, you know, very explicitly change the social order, right? Um, so there's some deeper challenges that we have to face of how much we draw in from ourselves, right? And then how do we use whatever thing we have to be very strategic? Uh, that's a particular piece that we've had to think very long, hard, and dear about. You know, making sure that every dollar that that comes in, we use as strategically as possible, thinking that it may not be no more money coming in. So, should this be the last dollar, do we use it effectively to enable us to put ourselves in some relationship with where the actual productive capacity enables us to make money to sustain ourselves in the long term? You know, that's a critical piece for us. <clears throat> you know, uh... We see a lot of opportunities. Um, I'm going to try to say them all in the in the time period. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of how we frame where we see opportunities or where to look for opportunities is in this uh, what we call our, our our hopeful contradictions framework. Um, so, in the Bronx. Uh, right, we often get characterized for our negative uh, statistics, our negative qualities. Uh, right, poorest urban county, highest rate of asthma in the state, of unemployment, you know, et cetera. It's food de pockets of food deserts, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, uh, while that may be true, we also have you know, all the, those, not that $9 billion, <laughs> right, in institutional purchasing I mentioned before. We have a really successful commercial corridors. Ford and Rose uh, is the third largest uh, in the city, gets as much foot traffic, you know, as, as Herald Square. Uh, we have the largest uh, food distribution uh, point, uh, the Hunts Point Terminal Market. It's a distribution point for 48 states, 55 um, foreign countries. Um, 
And there's a lot of those, <laughs> there's a lot of those things where like resource poor, but asset rich, right? And, and basically as we identify what those are, we see that like as a huge, um, huge opportunity. Um, so the, like our asset mapping workshops and processes are really important uh, uh, for us as a way to uncover things and help develop overall strategy. Um, so, you know, one, I'd be, uh, I'd be crazy not to, not to mention this, you know, one huge thing we're excited about uh, is, you know, one of our founders is, was um, Phil Thompson, Professor Phil Thompson, who was a professor at MIT, who is now the deputy mayor for strategic policy initiatives uh, in the city. Um, so Phil will be overseeing a lot of agencies that we think um, uh, are opportunities for us to to work together. We see opp opportunities with small business services in uh, fig helping to figure out how we could support businesses that are interested in community wealth. Um, we see opportunities with DYCD, which is also uh, in in the portfolio, uh, particularly with democracy building, right? So, I think I think we we have an opening now to really figure out how do we structure democracy in our places. It's not just uh, voting, you know in the ballot box and even then, especially in the Bronx, our numbers are horrendously low. Um, uh, it's, it's also about community asset mapping, folks uncovering what, what they have. I, I, you know, a lot of folks don't know, just for example, uh, one of the, the big things is pension funds, right? When folks are, are realizing that, <laughs> that we, you know, the city has, I don't know how, it's, it's got to be over, like, it's got to be like $100 billion or something. Uh, 180, there you go, $180 uh, billion dollar pension fund. Uh, some of that gets used to, you know, very small, gets used to, uh, for affordable housing. I know, right? Talk about, talk about, <laughs> talk about assets. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, some of that gets used to finance the real estate pressures that we're that are displacing us, right? We could <laughs> uh, use it differently. It's uh, it's our money, right? And and also, you know, in organized labor too. If you just look at eleven ninety nine, eleven ninety nine healthcare workers, uh, uh, thirty billion dollar pension fund. So anyway, we see we see opportunities there, and 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 for us, democracy is also about knowing those things and getting support and to take action on that. Uh, it's, it's, you're, you're able to engage from a much more powerful place when you have an asset-based framework versus a scarcity framework. If you start with like, wow, we got stuff we could play around with here, uh, we, we, we can move forward. We, we also, um, so that is an, an amazing opportunity. We also have uh, this fellowship, uh, MIT uh, CoLab, we, um, run this, this Melking Fellowship Program. Um, and this la our latest cohort of fellows are elected officials from the Bronx and Central Brooklyn, both city and state folks. We have brought them to Mondragon to immerse themselves in that model and see what are things that they could uh, help, help adapt and support and you know drink the economic democracy Kool-Aid. Um, and, and fo you know, they're, they're really creative uh, 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 and have been around, you know, the, you know for, for a long time and are, are strategic. Um, and I think tapping into the, those fellows as a resource to develop political will and also to, to develop strategies uh, for leveraging government to achieve some, to help some of the, our projects achieve scale, I think is another huge, huge opportunity. And, and that kind of work needs to continue. You know, we have I, like 13 fellows and we need, to, we need to do that with, you know, a lot more, uh, a lot more legislators. Um, and I, I'll, stop, I'll stop there. I, there'll be more opportunities for questions to talk, talk more, but that's our general approach and how we see opportunities. And I think those two things 
um, are are really important for us in, in Vegas. Um, so some things that have been working really well in, in PR, uh, at the Centros de Apoyo Mutuo, the mutual support centers, many of them have comedores, which are like lunch rooms, like where they are feeding lots of people. Um, and the way that they've structured that, because there isn't money, there isn't a lot of money coming in, so it's like, what's that circular motion happening? Um, and it's sort of like this trade economy that's being, you know, holding, really holding it down. So in, in exchange for a plate of food, many of the comedores have been uh, offering like a trade of either you can offer a monetary uh, gift you can bring ingredients so whatever if you know you had some plantains that you know made it through then you can like bring that um, or if you went to the supermarket and have some things then you can bring that and then the other form of trade is work so like offering to like support in the kitchen or do some other sort of work um, that will support the community in in uplifting everyone together um, so that's really working um, in terms of like, I don't know, thinking about like we're not in Puerto Rico, so thinking about like what this conversation is for us and what um, like economic democracy looks like for us is, um, yeah, thinking about if like if folks are often people ask me like I want to go to Puerto Rico, I want to help, what should I do? Um, and I just really offer like for us to think about um, and just in general when we travel, right? But like not. Um, thinking about how, what trade can look like, um, how we can be like giving and receiving at the same time. Um, so if it's like a particular skill that you can offer or a particular resource, and then like really listening while we're out there, like what can we gain from folks there? And then for me right now, like I was there for a month and a half recently, and for me the trade continues. Like I have made a priority to speak as much as possible because the organizers and the activists who are doing the work are not here, right? And there's this huge audience. So it's like this trade that continues um, that I've really kept close to my heart um, in order to continue, you know, maybe someone here will be inspired to give a skill or give a monetary donation somehow and continue that sort of, uh, that trade and that economic, the economy that's really f like supporting activists down there. Um, another thing is, is, is really creating spaces like for this, this thing to be, for Puerto Rico to be talked about. Um, as like it sort of loses steam in the media, um, it's important to like keep PR and just keep like these things in the com in, in the conversation. Um, and, and with like funding streams, so um, if you like do wanna support and, and just the way we've been talking about it, like oftentimes people are not 501c3s or do not have that like, that like title, you know, they're not sort of in that same framework as many of us are in the US. Like it's, e you know, not easy, but it's like more people will say like, I'm gonna be a nonprofit and that structure is there. Um, it's different, it's different structures in Puerto Rico. Um, and so a lot of like admin work that takes a lot of resource, um, which I'll also say like a form of trade is also saying like, I'll write a grant for you because I'm a really good grant writer or like I can do this admin piece or I can be a fiscal sponsor. There's like so many different forms of trade that can really um, happen uh, and so so yeah just like sometimes it's like a PayPal account um, so I think it's like our work for like people who are more used to like official titles and such to think about like they're not necessarily like like weird or like not official because they're asking for money through a PayPal account so it's for all of us to be thinking about like how are resources um, named like what what are resources and just like how do we like really think about that um, yeah, and I'll pause there. And, and that connects back to that infrastructure, how can we do solidarity that's just not saying I'm with you, but actually providing a, a skill or a mindset. Try to, uh, there you go. Uh, a kind of solidarity that's not just a staying, you know, saying the words, but but providing something that is again connecting to the agenda there. So we got some time for some questions. Uh, I think I will take three. Oh, we want to take three. We'll take three. So uh, we'll take three questions. Uh, say uh, who your question is for, and then um, we'll again take three of them, and, uh, and then we'll have the responses. Go ahead. So I start here. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, everyone has brought up issues. 
I was most impressed. I have a lot of questions, but I only have one. Uh, under best practices, the fourth item was bank financing business support. So all these things seem to point to how the banking industry in America is affecting. I was very impressed by the fact that you might do a good thing, and then the people who are against you pass a law. A lot of the stuff that's going on is the Roman method of divide and conquer. So my question is, I know there's municipal credit unions. I belong to one, but it's a small section. How many have been looking at the possibility of advancing something that I think North Dakota does, and that's a state bank? And they take all the funds and they bypass the vast corrupting banking industry. So I don't hear that much about it. I mean, it works well in North Dakota, and North Dakota is so democratic. Yeah, uh, my name is Ben. I had a question um, about uh, Cooperation Jackson. I'm a member of a, a Solidarity Economy reading group, a study group, and we read Jackson Rising, and thank you for that tremendous resource. It's a beautiful book, if people haven't read it. Um, some people who read the book found in a chapter an email about Malcolm X Grassroots Solidarity to reach out um, and, and we're having trouble getting in touch and just wondering what are the, what's the best way to support the projects from those of us that are not down in Jackson? Um, this is for the brother from the Bronx, Yeoman. I would like to know how would you suggest do asset mapping on undoing racism as part of this solidarity economy? Thank you. There's an institute for um, undoing racism, People's Institute for Solidarity and Beyond. There's Milt Vega, blah, 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 Anti-Racist Alliance. So shall that be a part of the asset mapping so we can see that that's something to keep in mind? All three of you are of color on that panel. That's great. So now do we need to actually name that that's part of what has happened in this system so we can create a real solidarity economy? Thank you. So the first question was public banks. Has anybody explored it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we've, we've, public bank. Um, we, we ain't ready for no public, for no state, state <laughs> bank. Not where I'm at. No, uh-uh. Oh, um, I would fight against that tooth and nail right now. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's again, um, trying to figure out timing, you know, and, and context, because I don't, you know, in our case, there's not a lack of political will. I mean, we, we, we got the, uh, enough political alignment and awareness of the, of the forces who are already there for it. The question is, you know, what type of fight would come with instituting that in our case? And are we prepared to, to uh, engage that fight? Are we prepared to win that fight? Who could we we, we count on uh, to to help us? You know, be in solidarity with that, um, and that would take. And in, in, in I think in our case, um, a couple of other southern cities, uh, at, at a little bit larger than us, also doing some of the same thing at the same time. Uh, so I think there would need to be more of a coordinated strategy uh, on a regional basis for us to be able to I think move to the next step. But it's not for lack of conversation. I mean, we started looking at it about seven years ago. You know, so uh, Chokwe Antar and folks, they, they, they are aware. It's, it's part of some of the, the you know, the long-term thinking. Um, but it's, it's, it gets back to a more of, of what was already there, like power mapping in terms of strategy and, and being able to move it. Uh, but it's definitely something we want to pursue, I think, just for everybody to be clear about that. Yeah, you know, uh, state banks hasn't been something that our the sort of our members have been looking at uh, a lot. Control of capital and being to developing the capacity to deploy capital, 
um, is something folks have been looking at a lot and is what we're thinking about with our Bronx Fund for Economic Democracy concept. You know, one of the things <coughs> we have been running up against or see, seeing a lot in our conversations with foundations, our conversations with city government, um, and like social impact investors, you know, those types, is <coughs> at least for New York, uh, there's not like a problem of lack of capital for things. It's a, it's a pipeline problem. Oftentimes, uh, and this, this is their analysis. I'm not saying uh, I necessarily agree, but what I'm hearing a lot is, you know, you sit with a foundation, you talk to them about, hey, you know, PRIs and like investing in some of the things we're, we're talking about. Um, they'll say, yeah, we're trying to be more mission you know, we're trying to like align our investments to be, you know, be more mission aligned, 100 percent mission aligned. You know, like those things get get tossed out. But we don't know where the projects are. We don't like like we don't we don't see it. You know, it's it's not hitting the scale. You know, we need it. it it's a uh, it's they, you know they often talk about um, uh, a pipeline problem. So we we're we're interested in figuring out like how we could manage a fund, like an endowment, you know, uh, where it's not like, give me all your money, just let me hold your money, you know? And, and then off the, the interest off of that, use that to finance uh, projects uh, and help, like, you know, like finance a lot of projects and help build, help build a prototype, pr prototypes for a lot of experimentation to, to go on. Um, and try, try best to, to, basically build that pipeline, you know, like get, get stuff in real estate, in business, um, in education, sort of ready uh, for these larger uh, in, like funds that are out there in New York that could be used right now, ready right now for, uh, for investment. That's the strategy folks are, are, are really looking at, looking at here. Yeah, so this is the problem about producing like a time-worn book. Some of those those pieces were written like over a 10-year, actually even longer chronology. Um, so that organization is morphed into another organization. So that email's been dead. Um, so um, the easiest way to get in contact with us is just Cooperation Jackson. Um, at Gmail, that's the easiest one uh, to get a hold of us at. Um, but you know, one of the things that there's some folks here here uh, with Democracy at Work, Tim, and some other folks here um, who are in partnership with us, you know, on the, on the direct local level, uh, that we would kind of direct folks to connect with to to be uh, in consistent contact and in, in relationship with us. I want to mention that Democracy at Work is a co-sponsor today also. So Tim, raise your hand, and Alan, just raise your hand up high. So working on a cooperation, on a Jackson Solidarity Committee right here in New York. Uh, more hands? So let me ask oh, I'm the, sorry. The question oh, yeah. about uh, undoing racism. Yeah. Undoing racism. Yeah, so uh, that is deeply sort of a part of all the, all the conversations um, we have with uh, residents when we do our economic democracy workshops. I think, um, you know, one of the things that we use to to really t try to exemplify how race has structured the economy. I mean, we 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 talk about slavery, but we we also talk about on like on on redlining. Um, where there's this wonderful exhibit by the de designing the we. Uh, that's what, that's what, yeah, this Designing Unde the Wii. Undesign the Red Un Line. Yeah, and the exhibit is, but the organization is Designing the Wii, and the exhibit is Undesign the Red Line. Um, and you get to look at, like, what some of the things, like, how they described, like, what were places that were ready for capital. You know, it'll say, like, uh, Negro infiltrators, and, uh, <laughs> which I, I was, that was so funny to me. I was like, wow. You know, and, like, any, you know, anything could, like, just, a uh, person of color walking in the neighborhood would devalue, de devalue a community. And 
And we talk about how those decisions were completely race-based, were, were race-made. Poverty was created through a racial, like, racial lens. So, like, when we talk about building economic power, when we talk about uh, building economic democracy, if you're talking about it in our context, to not have, not understand how race has been central in structuring our economy, and then, and, and thus in identifying those structures, like, um, uh, ra you know, uh, racial justice has to be embedded in our intervention and shifting them or uh, eradicating them in some cases, right, uh, uh, is, is central, to, central to our approach. And I think, that's, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that's the responsibility of anyone doing economic justice work uh, in this country, uh, at least. Um, so, yeah. I also want to add, um just like how important it's to remember that like we each come from like history. Um, you have a history that you're coming from, you have a history you're coming from, and that we all like make up these, these systems and these um, like the work that's happening. Uh, and in addition to like recognizing the history of like African Americans or the history of like Puerto Ricans, it's like how that has impacted me and how I'm able to show up to you know these spaces. Um, and like, for example, like colonization like does a lot to the spirit. It does a lot um, like on a cellular level. It does a lot to like who I am and like things that I've learned about money, things that I didn't learn about money, things that I learned about what I deserve and what I don't deserve and like what's possible. Um, and so just adding that into this conversation around like thinking about structures and thinking about solutions and within those conversations, we have to constantly be remembering like who we are as human beings and like what we're each coming from so that we can really sit down at a table holistically and be like, These are, this is all the baggage I'm coming with and that has to be included in the conversation, which I'm sure shows up in all of the assemblies and the like community meetings because it can't not, but like as we're coming up with with solutions, remembering that we're like also individual, whole human beings coming up with solutions together. Hey, uh, my name is Ramon, and I'm gonna stand up because I'm short. <laughs> um, I have a question for Gabriela, and that is, uh, how do you, how do the practice, how to make the practices that you're fostering with, that the community is fostering with, after the crisis, right? So now there's this imperative where people have to come together with the resources, pull their labor, that exchange. But how do you make that persist after the crisis has passed? And what is the crisis even, right? How you doing? My name is Shakur Al Jawani. Um, I'm a coordinator of the New York City Community Energy Cooperative, and uh, we're building, uh, putting uh, solar panels on low-income housing co-ops uh, throughout the city, uh, and we just put uh, seven and a half kilowatt uh, panels on Nazareth Housing Co-op in Lower East Side, and uh, 25 kilowatt uh, um, uh, panels on uh, Housing Works. In, uh, in in central Brooklyn, and uh, so I was wondering if uh, uh, if if the uh, particularly in the, it goes to the brother in the Bronx, have have y'all considered uh, joining uh, folks in the fight around energy democracy and using assets of of uh, sun coming to, uh, on our roofs, on, on our land, and our communities, and using that as a way to generate uh, 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 not only clean energy but also uh, resources to be able to support uh, community operations for uh, uh, for energy democracy. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is David. Um, I had a question to, for the brother from Jackson and also for Gabriela too, in terms of some of the those, those nonprofit foundation forces that are coming to bear right now in Puerto Rico. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interest in Puerto Rico on the part of some of the U.S.-based foundations. Uh, to start sending money or raising money on behalf of the people in Puerto Rico. And you had mentioned that you wanted to create a dynamic with a kind of structure where you don't have to rely on those foundations for that. And uh, so I wanted to just, you know, what, what are some of the pitfalls? Why do you think that is um, that these foundations, you know, sort of like all of a sudden woke up and say, oh, you know, this is a, a disaster capitalism in a different sense. And if you could expand on that.
Um, yeah, so we're not a few weeks after the hurricane anymore. Um, and, and, and we've seen like as time goes on and if you've been following like Puerto Rico, power comes on, power comes off, up and down. Some folks still haven't had power even since Irma, which was like a few weeks before um, Maria. Um, but like as people sort of get back into like normalized, we sort of like go back into like the comforts of capitalism and like nuclear family and like stay home, eat dinner by yourself, go to your job, take care of yourself, like that mentality. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of the reality. It's unfortunate when like so many beautiful things were happening collectively immediately after when like you didn't have power, you didn't have an option. Um, so I think right now the conversation is really around um, how do we continue like a conversation and continue reminding people of like what was possible and what is possible and then really doing like the groundwork of of some of these things we've been talking about like a lot of these conversations around economic democracy or like banking or cooperatives like haven't um evolved like amongst lots of different groups like individuals most certainly are like aware and thinking about it but like as a collective it hasn't really um evolved too far so i think that's where it is right now it's like what models exist what models can we use and and replicate but doing that work of sustainability for activists like i have to also take care of myself so that i can continue continue in this movement um and then keep bringing people into the conversations to get like that massive power that, that people power to then mobilize on some of these on some of these things that are possible and a lot of folks have been traveling from puerto rico to the u.s to visit p particular places and i'd love to maybe connect you with some folks um to see to to learn more and and see what that groundwork is yeah everyone is thinking about energy in in the crew now uh it's um it's been hard to figure out like how do we engage and what's the the best the best ways to do it and um we've been we've been trying to partner partner with folks and the community based organizations that make up uh the folks that lead BCDI are part of like larger coalitions uh that deal with uh, climate resiliency and uh uh environmental justice um and that kind of stuff one of the things that happened though concretely for us that made us like, yes, we gotta continue to try to grow in this space. One of our partner organizations is the Northwest Bronx Community and Clergy Coalition. They went through our economic democracy training series and then we did something else with them around the social determinants of health. Uh, and through that, uh, they were strategizing around how to take advantage of the healthcare transformation that was going on. Uh, to build economic democracy. And they created what's called the Healthy Buildings Program. They are working with Montefiore Medical Center to identify uh, buildings that drive asthma hospitalizations. Uh, so like the concentrations where folks are going to the emergency room for something that's really preventable like asthma. Um, and working with Montefiore to see how we could partner to finance um, interventions that both address the health piece of it, right? Mold, pests, uh, could be triggering air, air uh, pollution. Um, and also, uh, and because all, all our folks basically live in multifamily buildings, right? Uh, and, and then also they'll figure out how to do um, energy efficient uh, interventions uh, and use local contractors <laughs> uh, to do the work. Um, and because uh, as organizers you're bringing, you know, one, it's a, it's a different way to engage the landlord and you're, 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 they're both bringing the landlord to the table and then they're bringing the hospital to the table for financing. Um, as a community organization, they're you know they're in a, a, a stronger position to say yeah these are the people I want to do the work you know, uh, and also like whoever they're plugged into like the churches and stuff like that when we're doing our asset mapping, you know who's got construction skills how do we make sure they they, they get they get into the work so the the program started retrofitting churches and now it's moving to uh, multifamily uh, buildings but people are like people see that that is absolutely the future. 
in establishing self determination. Uh, we have to have our own energy production, own our own energy production capacity. Um, and yeah. Um, so Puerto Rico is an island in the Caribbean, and they have lots of sun, which is awesome. And so, so a conversation that has been, especially post-hurricane, has been solar panels. And there's a really amazing organization called Casa Pueblo that's been working to get like solar panels throughout the community. And they've just opened a movie theater that's run off of solar panel, which is, again, just like, yes, like homes should have solar panel. And a, just an example of, like again, what is possible in our community um, with solar solar energy and then like conversation island wide um, they're like yeah just like privatization in general like pushing that really really hard um, and solar panels is like one way there's lots of companies sort of really looking for that opportunity to say we'll bring solar panel to the island like we'll be that company and then we like really needing to pay attention to the nuances of like negotiations and things that happen and like what are we missing when the energy that comes in doesn't then go back to the public or like when it's not localized and can't really be coming right directly to us. And we also have this fight in New York State, New York Renew. Uh, there's legislation sitting up there in the New York State Senate, Cuo uh, and Cuomo's been waffling on it with a carbon tax and also just to bring it here. And, and some of this is actually a, some, uh, some support going to Puerto Rico uh, that's coming out of New York State as well. So this is a huge issue that people really can, by putting pressure on, uh, can make happen here at home and also that we can be in quality solidarity for, with others. Did you want to say anything? I'd be. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a central feature to what we're trying to do, um, but also trying to do it within the context of it itself being sustainable. Um, um, we are not We are not at this stage say against um, this early stage in Jackson against as many individual homes uh, having like solar panels, you know, that's in our society, that's people's like, right? But we are asking people to, to consider what is the overall cost of even producing that? Because it's not necessarily, the mass scale at which it needs to be produced is not carbon neutral. Not at this stage, it wouldn't be at this stage. Um, and, and part of this for us, is we're trying to battle like this individualized notion of everything, that we all gotta have individual solar panels and like part of that's a you know against public infrastructure, which we think is the wrong orientation to take. So more of a community aspect of how do we create, you know, a new community asset around the solar that people can draw upon and redirect how we utilize energy and our relationship to it. Um, so that's a debate that we we are having. But one of the things that we've been actively trying to raise some resources around uh, uh, is doing a, a, a solar demonstration project uh, that will be tied to, to this eco vision that we've been working and struggling to uh, put together, um, you know, on, on the community land trust. Um, so trying to do that in such a way where there's off the grid housing, but it's, it, it, it's, we create our own network of the distributed energy and trying to do so in such a way um, where there's some beginning of experimentation with the degrowth and the de utilization orientation so it's not like access 24 hours a day and how do you how do we deal with that uh, because just producing more uh, is not necessarily better for the environment that's that's a position that we take it might not be a popular one here but but that's an argument we willing to have with everybody um, uh, the other piece that you would ask about philanthropy that's that's a tricky one you know that's a real real tricky one I mean uh, for us, We've tried to, as best possible, uh, maintain a certain set of principles about um, we want partners. You know, we don't, we don't, we're not interested in uh, charity for charity's sake. And, you know, you just come in to do good for us on the basis of how you think good or what good is. Um, so that's a critical piece because that's not most of the orientation at all. Um, you know, then there's nuance to making distinctions between what the program officers are willing to do as opposed to what the, 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 the factual folks who are making the decisions are willing to do. Uh, so there's a fight there that has to happen, you know, but 
um, you know, one of the big things that we are constantly struggling with, you know, is to educate ourselves, to educate our base, to educate our community. Not all good money is good money. Um, you know, and, and, you know, how we deal with that, you know, uh, we just, um, you know, how, how people, and I'm mindful of this because I'm not born and raised in, in Jackson. You know, I'm kind of there at some people's invite. Now, I've been going in and out of there for a long, long time. But, you know, uh, I find it interesting that, you know, just yesterday, um, uh, we had the Rockefeller Foundation and the Zuckerberg Initiative uh, in Jackson, um, you know, that, that were there. And I was just like, oh, that's, that's interesting. That Y'all can just show up anytime y'all want and, you know, um, you know, dangle some few things at folks and, and create crab in a bucket type dynamic uh, if we aren't careful. And what that means, uh, you know, to, to me, uh, which I was saying to folks last night, you know, the challenge for me now is to, to go back, you know, home and be very clear that a, that a struggle has to be waged for a higher level of political unity and political understanding so they don't come in and just divide the community on the basis of who they will support and who they won't support, you know, uh, and, and what they think is important, what they think is strategic as opposed to what we determine on the ground is important and strategic. Um, you know, but, I, you know, we also can't kid ourselves that um, uh, we don't need some of that money, but I think the orientation that we try to take is, you know, look, y'all stole that from me and my ancestors in the first place. You know, that money is a result of, of some hard uh, working labor. So I'm not coming here on a certain level to ask you for anything. You know, like, this is what I need. How are you going to get it to me is the question that I think we need to be taking that type of orientation that closes a lot of doors. But I think the more of us really, you know, gain our own strength and network, we can take that position far more solidly, you know, than, than having them pry us off. And that's what I think the call for a deeper level of unity, you know, from our side of the equation uh, uh, is necessary. Um, you know, I think to be able to deal with the asymmetry of power that, that, that presently exists. Yeah, I think as it's interesting, like as attention to Puerto Rico has been coming more, you see more like foundations and grant makers and folks sort of like writing Puerto Rico into some of the like, you know, opportunities. And yeah, I, I guess I'll just to add, um, is is like people power, like people, like individuals, you know, if you have like five, 10 bucks, if you have a hundred bucks, if you have a thousand bucks, like whatever it is, um, and this is something that we've talked about is like, is is continual support. So um, like if I, if I membership, right? Like if I can give $50 a year to an organization that I know is doing that like groundwork, then that's, you know, $50 less that they have to like hustle to get from some foundation and multiply that by 5,000 people, right? It really adds up. Um, so just, yeah, shifting as much as possible, like a call for all of us, um, how we like support people that we really believe in the work that they're doing. And, um, with that, just another call to like what you were just reminding me about, um, like land is, is such a resource. And, um, I haven't talked too much about, I haven't talked at all about this, but I work a lot with soul fire farm upstate and they're really working on like, um, just the black farmer population dropped and like so much of what is built on this country is built, you know, on like black farm land labor. Um, and so how do we get like, especially like black people back, you know, to have that opportunity to, to grow food and to get, um, to do that and to have land ownership and to um, get younger folks into that picture. Um, so just, yeah, land. Hi. Uh, so, Jeremy, you said like three or four times um, achieve scale in. Tell me what that means, because that we hear that all the time. So, in in various ways, like go to scale, sort of. What does that mean? Uh, and that's for, for more broadly, right? Like, you know, sort of like, what does that mean? Two, three, 
Uh, yes, my name is Muwata. I'm rep I'm a, this is a question directly at you, Kali. Uh, an interesting, do you see what you're doing down there, and how do you see it in building a real, not only ideological, but political push about, against neoliberal capitalism, which is part of the problem? And how do you all see, um, see doing that is be, you know, besides this, okay, the education and building the people's assemblies? But how do we actually make that happen? Because until we push away, you know, neoliberal capitalism is going to continue. Hi, my name is Camille AC. I live in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. I've started a group called Assembled Neighbors of Empire West. Uh, I'm really focused on trying to experiment with municipalism in my neighborhood, but my question is for Kali, and it kind of piggybacks off the other one, which is how do you focus on small wins while maintaining a revolutionary core? Right now, for example, we are focused on trying to improve the post office, and the people who are radicals are like, the post office, let's smash capitalism, and then, but my, my neighbors don't want to talk about smashing capitalism. They want to talk about displacement and getting better services. So how do you focus on small wins, challenging the state, and also maintain the revolutionary core? Yeah, so to, to be clear, we're still arguing what scale is internally. So I'm gonna say something now, <laughs> and it'll be, it could be something else tomorrow. <laughs> you, know, I don't, you know, like we're still like, um, Determining, determining that. And what I like about that, though, is uh, we are trying to determine scale for ourselves. And oftentimes, other people are trying to tell us what scale is. And I've see, I see folks sort of getting swept by that. And I think it's important for, uh, for folks doing the work to determine what scale, what scale is. And the, what the conversation is now internally for us is, um, Oftentimes, scale is thought of as big. So when we, you know, like the, inf the, the projects we're, the, we're trying to launch, when they're as big as humanly possible, uh, you know, we've, we've reached scale. Um, and for us, I think we're thinking about it more as diversity. So there's a lot of frustration around uh, doing something that doesn't address a root cause. And every time we try to think about projects that address root causes, it's not like one thing that's really big. It's, it's having the capacities to address the issue from different dimensions and different, different angles, which is why our model is those six pieces. And we, we think that like if, you, if we have the capacity around capital and around planning right, and around production, and, uh, and, uh, and education, right, um, and advocacy, and I missed something somewhere there. Oh, procurement, right, business development, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and support. If we, if we have those things, at least at its core, um, and those things are like structurally owned and co governed by folks in the community, our model has achieved like we've we've achieved scale, um, and and it's important. And for us, the the other thing is we're Bronx wide, and we're Bronx wide for a couple. Well, for one main reason that like you know, oftentimes what happens is folks are either just like are thinking about our neighborhood, which is important. I'm not trying to like stop that now, or like thinking citywide, and like borough wide is not like a unit of analysis, so to speak. Often, so we're we're trying to put the importance that like. Like that is really helpful for us, for folks to, for planning and, and developing strategy, looking at the, the whole Bronx. But the, it, for us, I think right now scale, we're recognizing though we're in like a, a regional economy, like real estate and finance, they like, you know, they think regionally in, in scope. Uh, so w we want the diversity of those capacities to be able to make interventions like in our region. So like when we have those capacities that are community owned and where we're, we're not just thinking about the Bronx, but understanding how the Bronx is positioned in a regional place, 
and and actually doing something at that level though uh we i that's what like scale is meaning to us right now but like i said like it's still uh being debated um and that's that's where we are i don't know if y'all want to just one real quick point on that um the kitchen table right so the you know Gabriella's work in Saikatsu, I told the story of Saikatsu because it's amazing because the kitchen table was so crucial for building the intimacy to take the, the, the connections to be able to actually build things out in a holistic way as opposed to a single issue way. And I'm convinced that one of the reasons they're so multi-issues because they started with the kitchen table rather than a funder in a, you know, in a, in a, in a side space. Um, but I think that that's just also something to, to remember that that kitchen table can be the scale at which we forge the connections that are necessary to kind of do the holistic stuff. And then regional, I totally agree with you on that. Uh, neoliberal capitalism, I think the last two questions um, are both interconnected on that. How do you keep it going, uh, but yet have this analysis like, let's not kid ourselves, this thing's got to be, it's the combat kind of aspect as well. Yeah, y'all wait for the end to bring out the big guns. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, uh, so all three of these questions to me, I think, are, are related. Um, so there's a there's a definitional piece um, that we've been looking at. Uh, how do we um, how do we interrelate and build a relationship? with 100,000 people because that's the that's the concrete scale of underemployment, chronic underemployment and unemployment in in Jackson. Now mind you the 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 city's only about 180,000 to 200,000 people. But that's what we re that's what you're really looking at. And the challenge for us getting into you know, the, the piece around neoliberalism, et cetera. There's a couple of different dimensions of that. You know, one of the things that we have to be mindful of, and we've been preaching, and some people don't like that in different ways, and that's fine. Um, you know, cooperatives without a solid political orientation can be a tool of neoliberalism, right? They can be very much instruments of neoliberalism. Uh, very much in the service of privatizing public services or, or fragmenting existing solidarities and collective services, right? And if we're not mindful of that and don't have a political orientation around that, we could actually very much easily be in the service of something that's actually against our people and against the solidarity that, you know, we are trying to foster and engender. Now, you know, one of the things that that is 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 critical is, you know, within this framework, um, part of the dynamic is we are we are asking, and I'm just going to be real with it. We're asking oftentimes one set of workers to be in competition with another set of workers, even in the development of co-ops. And how do we bridge the gap to be? You know, how do we extend the solidarity? For us, we think that there's a development of how do we work on a, to scale, you know, towards transforming. The supply chain and the value chain, in in the in the areas in the, in the relationships that we have in which we work, um, and then how do we move things immediately as as much as possible out of the dynamics of market logic, or at least the exclusivity of mar market logic? So one of the things that we have been why I brought up in the beginning the nature of the solidarity economy from the beginning. I think we often miss that particular dimension. I know like we had it as an analysis, but you, we, I would self kind of forgot it and are now trying to repivot ourselves to, to come back to it because we just really had to ask ourselves a question. Even if Cooperation Jackson, every single thing that we've written up had an idea about, you know, if it came to, to fruition tomorrow, that's not 100,000 jobs. That's not. That's nowhere near 100,000 jobs. We calculate at most, you know, with everything that we've talked about, if it was operating full tilt, at maybe 10,000 jobs. Now, now wrestle with that in terms of the overall goals around 
uh, uh, that achieving or laying a material foundation for for you know the attainment of of uh, uh, self determination. It's insufficient. You know, it's grossly insufficient. So if you just stay connected in the realm of what the work of cooperative peace can do and not look at the actual development of the overall solidarity economy, then I think you're looking at it wrong. Uh, and the way in which I think we deal with the neoliberal piece is really, I think, places like Puerto Rico, um, the, the other dimensions of what many of us would call the mutual aid dimension of you know, work. How do we fully integrate those systems into the worker cooperatives or the consumer cooperatives or you know, the, the community cooperatives that we're developing and the housing cooperatives and the land trust? How do we build relationships which rely upon mutual exchange as opposed to market exchange, particularly the, 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 you know, the exchange of, of dollars or other form of credit? How do we build those systems where there is a circulation of value, there's actually a production of, of the creation of value, which is not dependent upon that particular dimension of the market. So the thing that we've been looking at as a first level of experimentation of trying to do that is, is the kind of co-development. We've, we've been doing a little bit of element of time banking for about two years now, um, you know, just on the, on the membership scale, but trying to scale that out to the level of the community because that is where we could potentially reach 40 to 50 or 100,000 people or more uh, within the scale we think about you know five to 10 years. And if we, if we match that up with what people call Treke or we, we, in our, you know, we're gonna use the term, which is because it's analogous, swap meet. Black folks know the swap meet, right? And that's similar in, the, in its old school way to what many people are calling the Treke or solidarity economy. So mix and match those two things in relationship to the cooperatives in their productive activity, primarily around food sovereignty and what we think is the community production piece, bringing in you know, us creating our, our own tools, uh, our own products. There we think over a period of time we can create some scale, create a value chain in the, in the supply chain that we determine that then takes us a few steps out of the market logic and then a few steps out of Neoliberalism, but we don't want to give nobody, but least of all ourselves, that we are totally going to escape that, you know. Because if you just look at it in in, in regards to, um, uh, you know, just your raw materials that you might need, we ain't gonna have enough paper in Jackson to 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 do everything we might need or cardboard. We're not gonna produce enough food on a consistent basis to do that. So this notion that somehow we're gonna create, you know, I call it the illusion of socialism in one city. That's Get, get, you know, like stop. This is not going to happen, right? Like we can make some steps towards changing some condition, but we are really, to a, to a great extent, dependent upon what y'all do and are able to pull off here and what other folks are, are able to do in other places to be able to create extended value chains and networks that then get us out of that that logic, right? Because we're not going to do it ourselves. We can think about doing it. We can set up some preconditions you know, in our own local conditions that might help. But I'm not under no impression or no, would, would not tell you, you know, anything different that you're gonna automatically escape that in the, in the, in the course of what you're doing, which is to me at the center of why, why politics in this engagement still has to be at the forefront and has to be in command. Now, the, the, I'm gonna shut up um, in a second. Um, <laughs> um, I think that the, the one shift that I think, you know, we did in this week was the, the New African People's Organization, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. One of the critical things that I think that we shifted that, that led us to this place with all this complexity, you know, all these frustrations, we asked ourselves a different set of questions after September 11th, which was, was, which was less on focusing on, you know, how do you, uh, um, well, let me put it this way. All the work that we aspire to is not going to be done by a revolutionary core. It's not. So how do you change and, and actually engage, you know, people on a mass level around solid principles and visions and then do so in a democratic way? I think we figured a few things out. We made a lot of mistakes. But to me, the mistakes are part of the process, right? And, and 
I'm as happy for the mistakes I've made as for the successes I have to the greatest extent that I keep learning from them and hopefully others around me and engaging with me, you know, learn from them. Um, I think it's important to keep a revolutionary core, you know, together, but if it becomes so insular that it's only talking to itself, you know, it can't really engage in mass work. So to me, I think there's a level of mass work and mass engagement that has to, to constantly take place. And the, the question of how do you actually do and engage, you know, in, in education, revolutionary education on that level is what I think we need to try to figure out. Because we have to even build that up to scale, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, in a very significant way in this country, a very, very significant way. We can't be thinking, you know, I think I think our thoughts cannot be, be centered on tens and twenties. We need to be thinking about the hundreds of thousands in our case as a starting place. All right. Well, Adam, quick, yeah. Really quickly, um, that, um, oh yeah, like in, in, in something that we've been thinking about a lot in Puerto Rico or folks have been thinking about a lot in PR is that there are sort of the like revolutionary folks who are like keeping that energy in the game. And then there's also folks who are like, not like so much on the streets and sort of take a different approach, but like the importance of like, having multiple different approaches in the space and making sure that we're all sustained and like at least connected, even if we don't all agree in all the ways, if there's like that political grounding in, in, in some way, shape or form, that like all those, mm -hmm. all those different approaches actually will work together mm -hmm. in the long run, because this is a long run game. This is not gonna happen tomorrow. Um, and then like with, yeah, I was also gonna say like political education, because it is a long run game and there are generations after this. Um, and there's like really creative ways to do that. I thought there's an organization in PR that uses art um, to do that political organization and then be going to the Centros de Apoyo Mutuo. So as people are coming for like food um, or whatever other resource, they also have like guerrilla theater and like beautiful like um, puppets and, and like visual art and all and music and all these things that like connect to people in a different way and are talking about like how did Puerto Rico get to this point of like this unnatural disaster part of it um, and having that political education just like constantly whether you're the revolutionary type or more like working in the system type um, it all has a role and a place. Protect your public goods. Take back your public goods. This kept coming up, whether it's CUNY or the educational space or the grid. Um, so I'd like to conclude. Uh, thanks so much to the panel. <laughs> and I see a few sandwiches over there, so feel free to, uh, feel free to share. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you.